We return to the series with Katsuhiko Chiba's first episode on this show, joining the writing cast from Access Onwards, as I discussed before. And unfortunately, it starts as many of the previous bad episodes do, with characters blaming and lambasting Neto for things that are not his fault, as Miss Mariko's class is out on a field trip, with Neto being tardy. This episode also confirms the timeline for events, with the group officially being in the 6th grade at this point, so Neto's a 12-year-old secret agent. A spy kid, if you will. But yeah, they're on a field trip to the waterworks, and Neto being late results in an argument between him and Rockman, who didn't succeed in getting him up. Again, I know I keep beating this over the head, but alarm clock function, install it. Hell, this one is actually so sensitive and malfunctioning that even when I dismiss them, the alarms still go off. It actually botched the recording of this episode previously. Now, unlike previous episodes where I savaged them over flanderizing Neto into a generic idiot protagonist just to bash on the guy unfairly, well again, this is being written by Katsuhiko Chiba, who has a better track record with such, and it's actually being used for a purpose within this narrative. Neto does have a bad habit of forgetting things and being late, but this isn't being used to berate the kid and instead is being utilized as an avenue for a story as a good writer should and the show in the first season didn't. What this is doing is creating an argument between Neto and Rockman that puts them both in a sour mood and being unwilling to work in sync with one another due to this temporary divide. And hey, that happens. Friends and family have natural ups and downs in their relationships depending on the day, and this is one where Neto is having an off day, and Rockman is exasperating it so Neto is in turn abrasive. Anyone can experience that. This is then creating a conflict in the story that needs to be resolved. As remember, their ability to maintain a cross-fusion form with help of the synchro chip is dependent on their synchronicity and the bond they share. If the bond they bear is damaged or in turmoil... Cross-fusion fail. And this isn't coming in out of nowhere. Yuichiro talked about this exact thing happening in the last episode as a built-in flaw with the system. As without a bond with the being you fuse with, why would it work when it's meant to take advantage of a bond in the first place? It wouldn't. Thus, Jiba is showcasing a scenario early on in the storyline about the synchro chips and how the users of them have to put their own personal egos and issues aside in the moment if they want to be able to use them and maintaining a positive bond with their navvies in the midst of a crisis. And this is something you could successfully do in a story like this with a child protagonist, as children through their teenage years don't have a great handle on throwing back their emotions and biting their tongue. Hell, adults fail at this often themselves without strict disciplinary training, or sometimes even because of that. So because Neto hasn't been taught self-discipline for matters like these, it's expected for him to be more raw in the midst of his arguments and things to not go as expected. Thus, this uses Neto's bad habits not to bash him, with no actual attempt to resolve them or make him work to improve himself to not repeat them in the future, or at least make an honest attempt to be better, but actually shows and provides an object lesson on why self-improvement is needed and his bond with Rockman needs to be maintained. Instead of such being a detriment to the show as it was in the prior season, it uses this storytelling as an asset, and, once more to contrast the prior execution, uses it as an asset to the narrative of the series. And with all of that brought about, why many people's choice for worse Dark Lloyd Net Navi, Bubble Man. And again, to call back to my Battle Network 3 review, I hate this jackass. So him being used for this... It is smart, as audiences are already against the guy, so the show is giving us a reason to hate on him, as opposed to it being the consequence of game mechanics and the grrr, evil sadist stuff from before. This happens because the field trip Mari's class went on was to the waterworks, a surprising one considering Mail and Neto were there the prior year to deal with one of Madoi's plots, with Dr. Freud even cameoing here and leading their tour. Which also feeds into the theme of the episode with him talking about personal responsibility by proxy of the reality that AI can't do everything, and manual labor still needs to be used to maintain any engineering marvel humans may ever fashion for themselves. 
and elements of reality that I really wish a certain idiot plot at the tail end of the dot .hack storytelling had actually remembered. As if they had, it would have actually derailed the entire idiot plot. This is where Bubble Man comes in, redirecting the water flow in the pipes to spike the water pressure to the point it begins to break all the pipes in the network. Which isn't quite how those things work, as water pressure is usually restricted by the size of the pipe and the quality of its construction, i.e. whether it resists corrosion, but there are some cases where water under heavy pressure can rupture and erupt out of fixtures to have them break everything within sex of a system. It is usually used for practical humor and comedies. However, here's where we get something I just generally don't like. Nitto keeping his status as a net saver a secret from everyone not already in the know. Specifically, male. And there is a specific reason I don't like it. It is completely pointless, and buying into an outdated trope about superhero identities, that's completely unnecessary in this setting. Mail's been out there helping him in a lot of these incidents. There is no reason to keep her out of the loop. Furthermore, their enemies already know who he is, and they're not exactly being subtle about their attacks. Are they seriously going to try and cover up the fact that they deputized a 12-year-old kid to help fight the Dark Lloyd threat? Because at this point, there's no reason to keep something like this secret, and it's not like he even manages to keep it secret for that long as it is. I kind of get why despite this, though. Male can't use a synchro chip by which to perform cross-fusion, yet. Thus, her or anyone following along with him is only going to put herself and any others that follow her in danger. And as Neto's fighting solo, he won't be able to defend them and get them out of the line of fire in a very dangerous situation that could lead to more than them suffering. It would be smart for him to try and head that off by keeping them out of it. What isn't smart is Neto not talking to her about it to try and explain it, as she's already been part of two previous incidents that didn't go bad because Neto unofficially stepped up. And now that he has, well, it's an act of responsibility in contrast to what the episode itself is showcasing with Neto and part of his character growth. He certainly made a mistake, and the show itself has as well, by buying into this old as dirt trope, but it's certainly one that's for the right reasons. Why I don't like it is, well, there's never any guarantee that where fights break out will be devoid of people. So if Nail were informed of what's going on, she could help Neto get anyone in harm's way out of the danger zone so he could fight unheeded. There's a whole pros and cons table for this certainly, but I just don't like unstated reasons for actions like this, as they tend to blow up in people's faces in the worst ways possible. Plus, he is not told to keep his netsaver status secret from the wider population, as he needs to use his netsaver credentials to get into places to stop Dark Lloyd threats. He is only specifically keeping it secret from his friends. Thus, he needs a valid reason for them to not be in the loop. In some regards, this is a carryover from my utter loathing of the Commander Beef subplot from the first season, in that it was completely worthless to the larger story, and put up unnecessary artificial barriers between characters that prevented their proper interactions, growth, and character developments. And Neto doing the same is not appealing to me in the slightest. As damn it, the kid's better than that. Regardless, Meijin is his supervisor and contact for the Netsavers, and gives him the details of the water pipe breakdowns that leads him into conflict with Bubble Man in the depths of the waterworks, once more compounded by the security robots the waterworks featured previously, which then shut down the second they see Neto's Netsaver credentials, allowing them at Bubble Man's viruses. <laughs> I'll puku you, you stupid little... <sighs> he gets his... He gets his... Also, credit to Wolfpack Productions' old subs on this. I actually like it when translators leave in characters' verbal tics like this. It adds to the characterization of the individual with the tick, and the sound symbol equivalent for this used in the games, Blub, just never sounded right to me, as that's not a proper onomatopoeia for the sound of a bubble popping. <laughs> yes, that is the beginning and end of his plan. You see why I hate this idiot? 
Though again, to the episode's credit, Bubble Man is such an incompetent bad guy that the only legitimate way to make him come off as a threat to our heroes is in an episode where their normally amazing teamwork is completely shot to hell. Though here is where we get another oddity of the Dimensional Area Story Engine, in that this time, instead of being launched from orbits, the Dimensional Area Generators appear out of dimensional holes and embed themselves into existing structures. Now, as I said before, the Dimensional Area Generators, also known as the Dimensional Area Converters, are not actually creating a space that bridges dimensions. They are an area where hard light holograms can be constructed out of data and act as a physically realized object. That doesn't exactly work when the generators themselves are program data that are themselves manifested, or alternatively use digital warp holes as a means by which to teleport them to a new location as that is technically explicable and happens much later in the series where things are turned back and forth into real objects and data, despite not being data first. We have technically already seen that a bit with how the synchro chips were stolen. However, the show already has an out for that, which acts as an excuse. Rush. As again, Rush does this exact thing to transition himself between cyberspace and the real world. And no one really grasps how he does it, as it's not exactly an ability he was programmed to have. Dimensional area converters, when they manifest like this, seem to follow the same logic as his warp holes, and that these generators are data facsimiles of the real ones programmed to cross over temporarily to set up an area and act as a bridge to realization, or going from real object to digital object and then back again once they've reached their target destinations. But that just invokes the logic of, if they have the technology and programming skills to do this, then why rely on the dimensional area generators at all? Why not just let all navvies have that ability? Well, funny story. It's actually explained in stream that something else has this exact program to transition data entities into the real world without use of the dimensional areas, and the Dark Lord's benefactor is aware of how to work it. He just didn't give them the outright ability to do it themselves, as he is using them, and they need to stay strapped to a leash that is his control over these fields. Later uses past that, which freely transition real and virtual entities back and forth, are then taking advantage of established uses in continuity to build upon something seemingly ludicrous. But by what was done before, not appearing to be so as a result. It's again an example of something that might seem as problematic or a plot hole or story problem in isolation, but when you look at the larger story around it, it is not actually shown to be, nor treated as such. Now unfortunately, as once more Neto and Rockman are at odds and Neto's been having a bad day, with Bubble Man manifesting itself right in front of them, Neto is in a rush to get this all over with, and not listening to Rockman about trying to deal with Bubble Man's sabotage first before fighting him mano a mano. However, this is once more a case where Neto isn't wrong. They've seen from Beastman's attacks on them the threat a realized Navi is, so wanting to fusion up right away to deal with him is an appropriate response. The problem, and an understandable one considering Neto's age and relative experience, is the logical thing to do is not always the right thing to do in a situation. Sometimes there will be other priorities that trump dealing with the actual active threat, which is Boltman getting control over the waterworks' entire sewage system. For that was still in progress and Rockman wasn't able to end. And also because they are new at this, well, Neto forgot to slot any battle chips into the PT's active memory. Again, Neto is just having an off day. To be fair, this would be only the third time he's used Cross Fusion, so he wouldn't have exactly gotten the muscle memory for that yet. We also get another question answered when Neto is told to try indirect methods of fighting Bubble Man. Why not just destroy the Dimensional Area Converters to shut these guys out? And again, the answer is simple. Anything made manifest by the Dimensional Area Generation System will obviously not be able to damage the source of what creates it, as it is projecting the field outwards from it. The second it would go through the casing of the generator, whatever would attack it would then resultantly vanish as it's just a hologram. And the casing for these converters are solid enough that nothing that was physically there in the real world that they could get their hands on would likely be able to smash enough of the generators by which to shut down the fields. 
I mean, it's not like they have on hand heavy explosives, and I doubt just breaking the buildings to use the rubble to crush them would be a viable alternative. This is where in contiguity with the episode, Cross Fusion failed, which I showcased before. Neto additionally forgetting to log out Rockman, making it so he had to take the long way back to Neto's PET to try again, during which Neto's left at Bubble Man's mercy. And it gives Neto a chance to see he was in the wrong all on his own, the faith each has in the other re-establishing their bond. As Neto tries to make up for the inability to cross fuse in the interim by trying to stall Bubble Man all on his own. This also helps to show that, while Bubble Man is by far the weakest and most incompetent of the Dark Lloyds, even just one of them is a threat and outmatches a normal human in all ways, once more emphasizing the importance of cross-fusion as the asset it is. With Bubble Man's retreat, the waterworks controls are restored, with Neto and Rockman having learned the lesson the episode was meant to teach, that they can't afford to be at odds with everything going on. And at the very least, going forward, informed is forewarned. The wrap-up. We have, it turns out, I'm the asshole, for Neto and Rockman being at odds throughout the episode. We have toilet humor to Bubble Man wanting to prank people with exploding toilets. The irony of that plot being that it's actually better than a lot of other toilet humor plots I could name, and this is in spite of me hating the character. Not out that this plot, yeah, I actually experienced it myself when my house had a sewage backup due to a tree growing into my sewage line. We have tick, 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 tick to Bubble Man's verbal tick. Yes, Chi Sao has one too, but his is not in every sentence, whereas it's overflowing, heh, with the demented scuba man. We have callback to the Waterworks security drones last seen, like, 50 episodes ago. And we have Peter Parker Syndrome, for needlessly keeping one's secret identity from their loved ones in hopes of them staying out of danger. It didn't work for Spider-Man, it will not work for Neto. Once again, we've got a good episode pushing the plot forward in, as I said, showcasing the limitations of this new tech and setting up rules for the conflict the show would subsequently follow. After all, if they never showed a bond being frayed, it wouldn't present well the flaw in the synchro chips. If we didn't see a normal human fail against a realized Navi, we might assume that they could be fought conventionally. And if Neto didn't try and ever damage a dimensional converter, we might just assume the show is being stupid by never making the attempt against all reason. Unfortunately, all these points would be refuted in a later bad episode of the series, but it just goes to show that early on, with the good writers on the show, they were making the attempt to resolve and showcase why that would not be so. I did a back and forth on several of these issues in discussion of this episode, simply because I saw way back these were critiques of the series at this point, as not everyone was on board the shift to this being more of a henchant hero battle anime from the cyberspace adventure one it was before. But again, I have to chalk some of that up to people seriously not paying attention to the media they ingest and what it's actually doing, intentionally or no, which may or may not explain these issues. Some of these, like the dimensional area converters popping up out of cyberspace like they did, were fair ones at the time, and only truly fixed by later lore expansions in Stream and Beast, which once more showed the story writers were not unawares of the issue and wrote in an answer that felt natural to the perception of an expanding narrative as opposed to a retcon. Bubble Man, as much as I hate him though, does not get his just desserts in this episode. His fall comes later, and he was used well here as the worst Dark Lloyd in along what was addressed in this episode to see Spotlight, so I can't exactly be overcritical of the guy here. I just hate him on principle at this point. But at the very least, his plan failed, and the toilets of the world shall not be used for evil on this day. Wow, that is a line. Did I actually write that? Jeez, the stuff you encounter when you're doing the internet reviewer gig.